Um, today, I want to have you wrestle a little bit with kind of, first of all, our, our cultural issues. I believe that we have a real problem in the church because we Americans have a mindset that is basically kind of contradictory to um, God and his, his word. And, and here's what I'm saying. We have this rugged individualism that, that maps out our culture, and our, our people, our nation. And we are different than, like if you go to Asia or whatever, the mindset is different than here. And why it's a problem here in America in the church is because when we read the Bible, we say, God is speaking to me and me personally. And because he's talking to me, God's trying to bless me, help me, lead me, share with me, 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 me. And the problem is, that's just not true. God is not talking just to you. And that mindset is so natural, it colors what you see and, and find in Scripture. And that affects how you respond to God's Word. But what God is actually trying to get you to understand is He's talking to us. 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 It's plural. It's family. And, you know, we naturally have to go through this process. It helps a lot if you... Like, back when I was a teenager, my money and my thoughts and my actions were all for me. I was out looking for the girls. I was fixing my car, spending my money my way, and then I met Jesus. He ruined everything, you know? But then, also, I met Cheryl, and my thinking had to change. We got married, and I couldn't think of me. And she couldn't thank me. We had to thank me, us. We were now a family. You destroy family if you keep thinking me instead of we, right? Well, this is the help that I had in a year. We had a little, stealing little boy. Now we had we, we, instead of just we and we. This is pretty fun, isn't it? And then I had a couple more, like we, 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 we. But the idea was, my responsibility, my mindset had to change. I could not go out and spend all my money on a nice, cool car like I did, and rebuild my car, and you know, put nice engines in it, and, and chrome wheels. That all went to the curb. My kids were going, food, food, food. I had to stop all that stuff, and that was gone. My mindset was, think of us. What do I need to do for us? The us became the entire involvement of my mindset. It absolutely changed. Does that make sense to you when I'm trying to see? But yet, when we come to the spiritual realm, we still kind of think of me. I read this Bible for God to show me what I get from Him and how He's going to bless it's me. It's not true. And I want to try to get you to, to see that it's going to take a miracle uh, uh, to, to change your mindset. It's kind of natural to do that with family, but the next major step is going to pass your family and see the church as true family. That's where it's miraculously changed. That's what God is after in our lives to bring us to that, that place. So the first thing I want to do is give you a little quiz. Who is the minister of Set Life Church? Us. Ruin my sermon, I quit now. <laughs> You're supposed to say Paul. And then I'm supposed to say no. <laughs> See, you ruined it all. You know the truth. That's <laughs> <me. laughs> no, perfect. The minister, but still, even if you don't hear that, here's the issue. When we come on Sunday, who's supposed to minister? Paul. What do we do? <clears throat> we get from him. We get food. We need to get encouragement. Me get support. Me get comfort. Me get whatever. Instead of coming saying, I'm the minister today. I'm coming to give. We still have to wrestle with that concept of what it means to come. We, ex you know, we expect Paul to show up. And we also expect him to give us 
strength and encouragement and, and so forth, don't we? But God expects you to come. In fact, we find different references like in 1 Corinthians 14. It talks about when all come together in the Word, it says they come together and you come and you all, it says prophesy, which just means to speak the Word. And he says you do that so that all are encouraged, all are comforted, all are, are built up. But we tend to, in America, say, yeah, yeah, Paul's the one. We'll listen. Thank you, Paul, for that great sermon. I appreciate it, Paul. Thank you. Go we'll home. Feel better for the week. But that's not really what God's after. He's after you to take a step uh, forward. And the first scripture I want you to look at, Matthew chapter 20, in verse 25, it says... Jesus called them together, speaking of his disciples, his followers, and he said, you know, the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. In other words, your boss thumps you and pushes you and shoves you and makes you do his will by force and grinding and threats. My, my brother-in-law is a pastor. He, uh, He's a church planner at the Columbus, and he's planted, I think it's his fifth church down in West Palm Beach, actually Palm Beach Gardens, and he's been there for a couple years, and it's a small church, and he's had to work outside, like most church planners do, to make sure he survived with his family, and he, he's worked for like uh, four or five car dealerships. His, his personality, he's good at selling stuff, I guess that's why he's started four or five churches because he can really do it. But he gets into these car dealerships and the first thing that happens is the boss says, first of all, you're going to lie. He says, I'm not. Then he says, I'm going to threaten you. And he says, go ahead. And they try to manipulate him. They try to force him. They try to threaten him. They try to threaten everybody else. And so he quits. And then they beg him to come back. And then he quits. <coughs> And then they do the same thing, and he quits. And then he goes to the altar, and he quits. Because the whole thing, the mentality there is this whole issue of lording it over each other, uh, flaunting their authority, threatening them with everything if they don't sell another car or, or do something dishonest or lie to the customer. And he says, I'm not doing it. I'm telling you, before you hire me, I'm not going to do this. And then they say, oh, good, that's good. We like a person like you. And two weeks in, they're going, okay, we're going to lie to the person here. I'm not doing it. I just told you that. And so, you see, the world doesn't think like God wants his people to think, does he? And this whole concept of the world's, world's way of doing things is absolutely the wrong mindset and the, the, the concept that God doesn't want. Instead, it goes on to verse 26 and says this, But among you, speaking of his followers, you will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, and what's it say? Must be your servant. And he, and he actually clarifies that whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Wow. Now that's where everybody in America says, not slavery is wicked and evil. America's got this foundation back in the days where the, these guys went over to Africa. They went into the harmless villages and killed people, tied them up, hauled them, and force marched them off to the, the coast. Then they literally threw them in slave ships like logs, I don't know if you do this, piled them inside these ships, laying on top of each other in heaps. As they died, they threw them overboard as they went to America, and the ones that survived, they pulled them out with chains in a, a row, and they took them up and sold them as livestock. It's evil. But see, you don't understand, there's more than one kind of slavery. That's the wicked kind of slavery. But in the Asian cultures, these Middle Eastern cultures back in the old days, the second type of slavery was actually volunteer. There was volunteer slavery. And also there was what they call slavery is when they got in trouble financially. They weren't allowed to say, hey, sorry, I can't, I spent all, you know, I just borrowed $40,000 from you, eh, spend it, can't pay it back, too bad, I filed bankruptcy. In their court system, they said, oh, no, 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 you don't get away with stealing from somebody like that. 
You are now a bond slave. That means you no longer work at your job. You quit your job and you go work for the guy you owe $40,000 for. And you're going to work however long it takes. If it takes you two years or five years or ten years, but you work for that guy, you give up all your money. He's going to give you food and clothing and a place to stay. Otherwise, you work until you pay off that debt. And when you pay it off, then you can be released. And a lot of those guys, after they did that, after the, they paid off their debt, they would say, you know what? You're a great boss. I love it. I volunteer to stay for the rest of my life as a slave to you because it's not really slavery. You're a great guy. And I, you love my family. And so I choose and volunteer to be a bond slave. You know what they do? They, they, they did the real body piercing in those days. They take the guy up over to a post, put <coughs> mallet, punch a hole through his ear. <coughs> and that symbol was he was a volunteer bond slave for the rest of his life. He chose it. He volunteered for it. True. It's what they did. Jesus is talking about volunteer <coughs> slavery when he's speaking here. He's not talking about forcing you into anything. He's saying, among my people, the church, the Christians, what I'm after is that if you really want to be a leader, you're not going to do like the world. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to be a servant, and whoever wants to be first, you must become their slave. You must be a whole different mentality or mindset. So you are such a crazy person, you do the opposite of the world, and you are around everybody, helping them and sharing with them and serving them and finding out what they need. And that's what it's called to be a minister. Isn't that what you see as Pastor Paul? He watches over you, he prays for you as he sees your needs, he tries to help. If you can't help, you find somebody to help you to help you. If that doesn't work, you find somebody else and he keeps working. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Cannot, <coughs> excuse me, stay just with Pastor Paul. Instead, it has to be the reality of each and every one of us of Sunlight Church. Make sense? Did you get it? And this is this is a revolution. This is a major shift in thinking from Americans. It's not going to come easy. It's going to take a miracle to shift us that far out of phase from our community and our, our culture and our way of thinking. It's a major shift that we must take. Verse 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. So Jesus said, I'm not asking you to do something I didn't already do. This is why I've come to this earth, to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. He not only was going to get to serve others, and remember that's what he did. Remember what he did? He said, listen, I'm going to wash your feet. That's what the low-life servants did, the guys that they were forced to serve. They'd have to wash everybody's stinking, smelly, rocky feet and get their face down there. Ugh. Nobody wanted that job. The disciples wouldn't even do it for each other. And so Jesus said, here, no, I know there's no one's washed feet here today, so here I'm going to do this. And they're going, oh, Lord, don't do that. That's, that's just gross. Don't do that. And then he's going, oh, no. Peter said, what? You can't do it. I'm not just going to let you, Lord. And Jesus, remember, Jesus said, oh, I'm sorry. If you don't let me do this, then we don't have connection. And then, you know, then obviously, crazy Peter goes, okay, give me a bath. He goes to extremes again, but, but the point was, servant is why I came. Servant is what I want you to rethink. And I want you to stop using the word servant, actually, and use the word slave. I am a slave to Jesus, and I'm a slave to you, my brother. Can you say that? I am a slave <coughs> To Jesus and the slave to you, my brother or my family. Isn't that crazy? Number one. Yeah. Here's how I want to begin to, to shuffle your thinking. Number one, we must have an extreme shift in our mindset and think like a slave. You must think like a slave to truly be a slave. I have to give you an example of my wife. Um, 
I know she won't mind. Will you mind, Hunter? Mrs. Rutter? Okay. Well, you can tell me now, shut up. But uh, Mrs. Rutter was, my wife cleans homes for a living. And so she's involved with a number of families. And Mrs. Rutter was a, it was originally from England. The rich in England are used to having house servants, you know, waiting on you, carrying your bag, and all that kind of thing. We're not kind of used to that thinking. They're used to having the concept of slaves in their home, basically, even though they're, they're not exact real slaves, but they have that kind of feel. Well, my wife uh, gets hired when she worked for the slaves in her years, cleaning her home, not being her slave. Well, one day she was cleaning the home, and this runner had uh, people visiting her and uh, so forth, and they were in the living room or talking, and she spilled something on her shoes and on the floor. So she calls my wife, Cheryl, can you come here? And then she says, clean my shoe. It's kind of a slave kind of thing. And I think most people would have said, clean your own shoe and quit. Not Cheryl. She quietly and humbly bit in front of all those people to wash her shoe, clean the floor, and cover her. Said, no. That's slave mentality. That's servant attitude. Just like Jesus would have us. What would you have done? <laughs> what would you have done? Exactly. Most of us, I, I can't say I even have been that way I would have said, you're done, lady. I only got a job here. You pay me money. I'm not your slave. And she did not. And she spoke a lot to those people there. Now, Cheryl's become so popular uh, there in the place that people are constantly calling her, wanting her to come clean for them. They know what she's like. She's supposed to be a house cleaner, but she's not. She becomes a nurse to them, a daughter to them, a friend to them, as she ministers to Jesus to them. And they all brag about her, call up their friends and say, you need to hire her, so she has to keep saying, boy, the one lady called and said, don't you like me? Why would you clean for me? She said, I don't have any more time. I work all day for five days a week. I have no more openings. That's not that I don't like you. And they're begging her, well, can I be in a waiting list? Can I do that? And why is that? Sir. Slave, Christ-like attitude that has such an impact upon that community that it's amazing to watch her as she relates to those people. And her testimony is strong for Christ. That is why God is saying, shift your mentality. Think like a slave. Because God says he gives grace to the humble. That's what we want and need as Christians, isn't it? That's what changes our lives. But it says he resists the problem. Well, where is pride shown? Usually not to God, it's to people around us. I'm not doing that for you. I don't care what you think. I'm doing what I want. I'm doing what I like. I'm my own person. I'm following my dreams. And all those things are what pride says because it's related to me and them, not us. And yes, Lord, I will be slave. Okay, are you always blessed? Am I losing you? Are you with me okay? Any, any questions? Okay. Ephesians 4.11 says this, and I want to show how this applies in, into the church. Because this is where I want to take you. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. What that is saying is Jesus gives to the church body five types of, of gifts, of people gifts. And one is an apostle. That's simply a church plan, a missionary. Uh, a prophet is a preacher. Evangelist is like Billy Graham. They specialize in preaching the gospel and they work with churches to, to build them up. Uh, then the pastor who, is, who resides in a local church and teachers who can come and go but also are part of the, the local church. And it says then in verse 12, their responsibilities, these five, and this is important, the, their responsibilities is, is to equip God's people to do his work. Notice what that's saying. Paul, the pastor,
pastor here, his responsibility is not to do the ministry, but his responsibility is to equip you and I to do the work and to build for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry. Notice, and, and let me make it simple. It's, it's, it's football season. Think of Paul as the football coach and you as the players. The coach doesn't run off the field and play the game. Instead, he coaches each member of the team. And every member is important. The center has to do his job. The guards have to do their blocking if you're on offense. The tackles have to do their job. The ends have to be busy blocking and catching passes. The backfield has to run. They're, 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 the thing has to work, and every per person is important. But the coach doesn't do the play. He does the equipment. He does the training. He oversees it, and he coaches those guys to win that game and play with abandon as a team. They forget their individual me stuff, and they think about, i got to take my responsibility, and then I work with my team. That's exactly what God is getting at in this, this idea. You are very important. The coach can't do the job. We have to do the job. We are called to take that responsibility. It, it, it's basically the word ministry used there. It's work of the ministry. It means to serve. <clears throat> In fact, the technical term is where we get the word deacon. <clears throat> now, a lot of churches have lost the concept of that completely, too. They, they set up a board of deacons to tell the pastor what to do. That's the most crazy unbiblical concept you ever heard of. The deacon means slave. So the slaves tell the boss what to do. Only in America do we do those kind of things. You know, all in America. That's what I'm saying. Our mentality of America is so corrupt. We, we drag it and ruin everything. Paul is the coach. And he is called to train us all to be deacons or slaves according to the very Greek concept. We are to be trained to be slaves. We don't come naturally as slaves. We naturally come as being bosses and telling what to do. We want to be the chief. To become a slave takes work. God has to work hard to, to rethink your, your thoughts, give you his word, and bend your will so that you actually become a true biblical slave. How many don't like me anymore? <laughs> How many don't like what they're hearing? <laughs> you, you hear, I want you to see this is so contradictory to the normal mindset. It's so hard to come into that I'm telling you, we need a miracle of God to make this really happen. And churches that move and shift into this new concept become a mighty force for the name of Jesus in their, in their community. I'm telling you. Number two, you are responsible for the ministry under the coaching of the pastor. Now, here's what generally happens also in church. I volunteer. Paul, I'll help you any way you need. You just call and let me know. No responsibility. I still am off the hook unless Paul calls me and asks me for one specific thing. <clears throat> That's not what the scripture is talking about here. The scripture means did you step forward and say, I will take the responsibility of this act. Paul, you don't have to sweat it any longer. I will do it. And you just make sure you watch over me so I'm not running off doing my own thing. But otherwise, because you're the coach and I'm just the player. But don't you set up at night and worry about that. I will take charge. That's what God is after for each of you to say, my responsibility. Is to read outside, I'll be there every week. Paul is there to keep calling me, make sure I'll show up. I'm going to be here, I'm going to do this. Or I listen, that whatever responsibility that God has put you into, it becomes such a problem. And, and why? Well, because first of all, slaves don't have any place to go anyway. Where's the slave going to go? They're already under the Lord and, and they do what He says. So it's not like I got a lot of distractions. I'm the slave and I do what He says. And not that, I love my master, so I really want to do it. And so you add the love with the slavery concept, and you have a force that's 
powerful. Now think about that. How many of you admit you're slaves to your children? <laughs> you are, honestly. You are. But you want to be. You know, exactly. And every, their need is your need. Their thought is your thought. Their pain is your pain. And, that's, and you want that. I'm not saying anything is not unusual in mentality if you put it in, in your framework of your home. But it's unusual if it's in the same framework of your church. Because then you think, well, that's Paul's concern. No, it's not. That's what we're going to see here. You are responsible for the work of the ministry of Sent by Church. And therefore, you must step forward and do this. Acts 6-2 is a great illustration of this. It says the 12 called the meeting of the disciples. And the reason they called the meeting was because there was dissension when it came to daily feeding people. There were widows that were homeless or broke, they needed food, and so they, they began to give a daily feeding of, of food for those that had need. Well, hey, the Greeks, they kind of felt like they were prejudiced against them. The Jews were the cool guys, and they all helped their friends out and left us over here in the cold. You find it in our culture between racial concerns. And let me tell you something. The Bible says there is no race but one. Paul says in Acts that all people are one blood. There are no race but the human race. That's my firm belief. But we somehow in our America keep doing this. And so groups feel like they're left out from other groups and, and prejudice against them. And, and they don't have that same concern. Well, they had that same battle with the church. There, there was conflict. And so the apostles were very wise. They called a meeting and they said, well listen, first of all, it would not be right for us to abandon our responsibilities, which were preaching and teaching the word of God to help them. And they, they, their responsibility was preaching and teaching the word there in that community. And is it important to feed the poor and care for them? Yes. But they said, we cannot drop our responsibility to take on this other responsibility. And so they had to stick with what God had called them to. If you remember, God has called preachers and to share the word of God and to verbally, and then they're going to share the word, but the preachers are the vocal ones. They're out there sharing the word. The apostles were in the streets. They were at the temple proclaiming daily the word of God. And it says, with their commitment of not giving up their responsibilities, many people believe and follow Jesus. Well, what happens in our American culture is the pastor has, has to give up his responsibility of preaching the word to care for the poor, help the widows, <clears throat> do all kinds of stuff. And so the preaching of the word ceases in such pressure like it was back here. And they saw the danger of doing that in the first century. If the pastors and the preachers here would have stopped preaching the word and cared for the poor, then salvation would have stopped. The gospel would have been out there for plenty. Yeah, they would have talked with each other in the little church meetings like we have, but the word out there in the community would have went to the ground to a halt because they wouldn't have time to spread the word of God and the good news of Jesus because they had to care for the widows. They saw the danger. Does that make sense? And so they said, church, listen here. We can't do this. The, the, we need help here. Verse 3 says to so the brothers, they said, select seven men who are well respected and full of the Spirit, and we will give them this responsibility. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did. They gave the congregation the responsibility, and the hungry were still fed. The other issues like this that kept coming, always they found the congregation to step forward and take the responsibility of the ministry. And as they did this, it says in verse 7, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted also. The most hardened Christian guys, the priests, were even coming under the conviction of God's word because 
the apostles would not stop the preaching of the resurrected Savior because they pressed forward and held their responsibility and the church stepped forward and continued with the ministry of the love ministry behind the scenes, God blessed greatly and many came to Jesus. You see how the, 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 both head, the head and tail of the coin is there? Both sides are important. But the responsibility of the, the preachers have to be kept but the responsibility of caring for the needy is important. Am I losing you? Okay. So where does that step in for us? Number three, then. You are responsible for your teammates at Set Life Church. Here's what I'm saying. John 13 is very clear. So, and this is verse 34 and 35. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Now, here's what most Christians say. I do that. I love, you know, her, and I love him, and I love everybody. And it's kind of like this feeling of this love that gushes out of my ears, and everybody knows I just how I love them. And you should know I love them because I'm nice. And I'm friendly. Don't you know I love you? That is not what Jesus is talking about at all. There's a lot of people that are going to go to hell that are really nice just like that. And they're not going to go to heaven. That's not what Jesus is speaking of at all. It goes on to say, your love for me, for uh, your love for one another, will prove you to the world that you are my disciples. The love that I'm talking about will be an evidence to the world that I am with you, that you're my followers, and I'm truly the living God. Now, if you go around saying, well, I love everybody, everything's cool, that's not evidence that anybody knows. That's not the evidence that the world's going to say, man, I knew that. I'm going to be in church next week. These guys are awesome. They keep saying they love everybody. They're nice. See, that's not what blows people's minds, is it? There's something else that's far deeper that Jesus is after. So let's apply these concepts, and I'm going to bring it deeper into your application of life. Number one, again, think like a slave. And what that means is actually in Scripture, I, I found at least 24, 25 places where the Bible teaches us to love one another, and what that means in application. <clears throat> One of those is Galatians 5.13. And it says, serve one another. And again, that idea that that word serve is the word be a slave and serve one another. It says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your self. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another. Here's what blows the minds of the world. When you reach down deep in your life and say, I was planning on doing this, but I just found out our widow needs help. You drop what you're doing, you go help. Or you get a phone call, man, my mom just passed away. You stop what you're doing and you become support. You know that? This is stuff that we naturally talk about. But you don't wait for the call. The real issue here as a slave, if you know, when you go to a restaurant, for example, again, they're not slaves who work there, but it's that same concept. When you go there, do you want to have to go, waitress, can you get over here? I'm a thirsty. Or you want the one that says, hey, need a refill? Give you a refill. Hey, you need something else over here? Hey, I bet you guys need an need a extra butter over there, don't you? Is that the kind of servant you want? That's exactly the kind of servant Jesus wants in you. With your eyes open. Because you're not thinking of yourself anymore. Because your mindset is slave. You're watching around. Man, Jamie looks I wonder if I should encourage you. <laughs> I should go and tell her how, how much God 
up to and see if I can help her anywhere this week. Hey, I heard somebody saying you might uh, do this or you, you might need help. Can I help? I want to help. What are you doing this? The more you have your antennas up, slave-like mentality, you're not thinking of yourself. And Sid, you know how many people come in there? Uh, my life is just rotten. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> I don't want people to feel sorry for me. Instead, you come and say, I'm your minister. What's going on? Because you know what the scripture says? God gives blessings to those who give. Give initially, give unto you for the sons. You come to give instead of take, you become a whole new concept of slave like mentality, just like Jesus who laid down his life for his friends. That is what we're after. Can you imagine a church that drives you crazy with people keep coming up to you and saying, hey, what's going on? Can I help you today? Hey, I think I, I, I you know, let me give you 10 bucks. I just, when I first came to Florida, I went to the Covenant Fellowship Baptist Church. That's where my parents went. And uh, we were, we left all our friends and everybody we knew up north and came here to Florida. And I was like, we were kind of overwhelmed. We went to this pretty good sized church. And walked walk in the door first week. And another, I think if you hear last week, Paul mentioned he went to a place and he said he asked his brother if they were invisible. That's what we felt like. Everybody shaking hands and stuff, walking right past us. And I'm like, we were already kind of discouraged when we got here because we had no more friends left. And then we felt like, same thing. I think I'm invisible. And I just kind of was discouraged. I went home grumbling and complaining to God. You sent me to this people. These people are so loving. They don't even say hi to you. And I was like, I'm praying. And, you know, God, bring fire down to heaven and wake those people up. You know, and then God says, shut up. <laughs> and now you next week, you're going to go there. And you're going to act like you've lived there all your life. And you're going to love them. And show them what it means to love. <coughs> me? Oh, man. <laughs> So next week, Cheryl and I, we did it. We went up to every person that we could get our hands on. Welcome to our church. Welcome to are here. Praise God. And then the pastor said, we volunteer. Whatever you need, we take. Give us the worst job. We'll clean toilets. We'll take care of puking babies. Whatever you want, give it to us. We'll take it. And you know what? All my little cloudy, poor me, going to go so fast to dissolve in front of my eyes because we were so busy with babies and stuff from then on that it was awesome. Because God wants us to not sit around waiting, but to be a slave like in mind and go do, do it. Does that make sense? Go do it. Go do it. Think like a slave. And here's what it's basically the concept of. Make yourself available to each believer, helping them as you are able, filling in the gaps and weaknesses they have with your abilities and talents. Don't hold back. Now, I know this is rough because Americans with the rugged individualism says, stay out of my business, my life is my life, don't mess with me, and I'll let you know if I need anything. Anti-God, I'm telling you, that's straight from the devil. That's nothing to do with Jesus or his church. And that's what I'm saying, it's such a mindset change, it's hard. God says, stick your nose in each other's business, love each other to death, you don't take a no for an answer. Now this is what this is kind of like what you have to do. How many of you got teenagers or have teenagers? That's how you have to do with teenagers. You stick your nose in their business and say, hey, don't come in my room, it's mine. It's no, it's not it's mine. What do you think you pay for that? Not, I'm not letting you use it for free, just in case you know that. But no, the teenagers are the opposite, say, and this is why we have a bunch of teenage Christians that go, stay out of my business. But you know what? I, I struck a chord there, didn't I? With the teenagers. <laughs> There's sure up everywhere. I, mean, I see teenagers talking there, but woo, they don't hear that one, okay. But you're responsible for the ministry. Here's what it says, Ephesians 5.30. Ephesians 5.30 defines love as these two words. Provide and protect. Provide and protect. That's truly the adding out of those feelings. You say you love people, then you provide for them as you see their need, and you protect them. You protect their name. You protect their, um, their uh, what do you call it, their respect to them. You, you, you protect their, their, who they are. You don't let people stand in the back. You stand up for them. You do everything in your power to 
hold and protect those that are your fellow believers here. You don't let anybody call you and say, and you know what Pastor Paul did, blah, blah, blah. You say, shut up. And I mean, shut up. I love that guy. Don't even start it with me. You want somebody to talk to you, find somebody else, but you ain't telling me nothing. Click. Take that. Because you know what? If you call up and say, I'm going to tell you a bad thing about your mother, I say, don't you mess with my mother. Guess what? That's what we do here. That's what Jesus is saying it's all about. You stick in there. You take responsibility. I protect the back of my fellow Christian. Don't come yelling at me about what Mary said or did. You go talk to Mary. You leave out. She's my sister. You don't mess with her. Make sense? Yes. That, that's what we're, we're talking about here. It's, and 1 Corinthians 12, 25 says, Have the same anxious concern for everybody with no division, which means in my terms, no clicks. Oh. We believers on this side of the room, we're together. Don't mess with us over there, you know, guys on that side. We are the in crowd. We mess with each other, but you don't mess with us. No clicks. You cross the barrier. You go across the other side. You look over there, guys, look over on that side. You guys look on that side. Look at this way over there. You guys are family. You know, you're way over there. And so, so that, give me the old hug. Oh, yeah, give me the old hug look there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Here's what I'm saying. Be as anxious for the health and well-being of your fellow Christian as you do for your own wife, kids, or brother and sister. That's how extreme is the same. You cross a quantum leap beyond just that little stronghold you hold there. And this is Florida. My family, we do it. But don't mess with me, church. If I feel like being around you, I will, but don't, I won't. Or the walls have to come down. Again, this is a massive change. God says walls come way down. You are big family. This is family, the whole family. Number three, be responsible for your teammates at set life. This is where you stick your nose into people's business. I know you nosy people like this, but you got to be careful what I'm saying here. The Bible says, and admonish, and that word means caution and warn one another. Caution and warn one another. In other words, just like any member of your immediate family, like your children, your brothers and sisters, whatever, caution and warn them when you see them doing wrong or erring in judgment. This is where people say, don't get in my business. God says, get in your business. This is why a lot of people like to go to big churches. Because nobody knows them, so you can't get in their business. But then that gives them the freedom to disobey God, live their lives, and no one messes with them, and they still feel good about themselves when they go home. Little churches are dangerous like ours, because we sniff out your business. We're not careful. We know what's going on. And pretty soon, somebody's praying for you, or talking to you, or whatever. You know what? That's exactly what God is after. You know what? We're not always... <coughs> So we have to, so we have to get involved with each other. Not in arrogance. Don't misunderstand me here. But just parents just like you worry about your children. And you begin a process. And at first people don't like it. But the Bible says if you really love somebody, you don't watch them just run off and jump off a cliff. You tackle them. You love them, you try to find out what's wrong, and they're so, what's going on, and then you work with it. Because you love them. It's not because you're trying to control them. You want the best for them. Does that make sense? Yes. And this is important, and I'm saying this is not natural. I understand it. And so, if you want to get in my business, please do. I mean, I'm more than happy to, to uh, have yeah, that. It doesn't mean I'm going to go down easy. I'm going to argue with you and tell you why I'm right. <laughs> but, but, I'm willing to hear this. Let me finish this with a story. Um, Sinterklaas. 
Anybody know who that is? Senator Klaus. Anybody know who that is? That's a Dutch. Anybody know who that is now? Santa Claus. Santa Claus is basically the old language of, of the bills where it's uh, Dutch and Belgian. The French translation is Saint Nicholas. The uh, German is Saint Nicholas. Got <laughs> <laughs> that German. <laughs> the thing that's important to me is that Saint Claus is probably the most famous person in our country. Atheists, everybody loves Santa Claus, but they don't. You see, when you translate the English as Saint Nicholas, he's famous for a very important reason. Very important. And his story is so powerful, what I just talked about for the last time we did here in this uh, talk is what Nicholas became famous for. Nicholas was a man that was born about 280. That's a long time ago, over 1700 years ago. He was born in the Roman Empire still. Where he was born is what we call Turkey today. But at that time, it was part of the Roman Empire. His uncle was named Nicholas also. And his uncle was a preacher. Nicholas's parents died when he was young and he was watched over by his preacher uncle. And he also was born where his family, his parents were very rich, very rich. And so he inherited a fortune. Well, as he grew up, first with the influence of his parents and then with his, his, his uncle, he <coughs> began to see horrific needs in that time. There were famines that swept through that area during that time, uh, like two or three times. People under famine, not in the old days, but in the famine of the old days, it wasn't like you could go up to <clears throat> Social Security and get food stamps. There were no food stamps. These people were suffering and dying. Well, Nicholas had such a love. He stuck his nose in the business of others. He was beyond his own little selfish world. And he literally exhausted his, his entire fortune by giving and giving and giving to the people of need. He became so famous. He's, in fact, for hundreds of years after he lived, he was the most famous Christian that ever lived. They have stuff in the Catholic Church all over Europe and everywhere about him. He was so famous because he lived what I am talking about. And he lived it to such an extent that the world was rocked to understand what it meant to be such a generous and godly person. And he was to the point where his next door neighbor, when he, when he was no longer as a child, his next door neighbor fell under tremendous, tremendous pressure. He lost his fortune. He lost everything. He had three daughters. And in that day, for you to be able to, to marry your, your daughter off to someone other family, they had to have a dowry. Anybody know what that is? The, the case with it, a lot of times it's similar. In some cultures, it's opposite. The guy has to give a dowry to the, the, the parent of his daughter. Not in this Roman culture. The guy with the wife with the daughters had to give a dowry to the family. And if you didn't marry them, they would not marry you. And they were left to be maybe slaves. Well, it got to the point worse where their dad, this guy that only had three daughters, he turned to a point where he was going to sell his daughters off to prostitutes to make the money just to support him because otherwise they were going to be in great danger. He went to that degree. Now, this guy professed to be a Christian. 
But rather than praying and seeking God and getting help from the brothers or whatever, the, the church didn't seem to be there. He went up into that level. He's going to sell them off. Well, Nicholas heard about it. He, nobody, he didn't talk to this guy. In fact, he heard about it. And he was so appalled at such a problem. But he would not go to that guy and face him. He didn't know how to dis discuss it with him. He didn't want to make the guy feel horrid. Nicholas, I think, had some kind of a, a mercy gift because he was so feeling bad. There's a lot of stories that you know and, and how we today came from this one incident. Because he was so concerned, he didn't want to confront that man. He snuck at night and had a bag of gold. And that's back where you get the idea of why some people use oranges at Christmas. It's actually the picture of that, that uh, bag of gold. And he snuck at night and windows back then didn't exactly have glass. They were kind of open back then. He took and launched it into the window, into the house, and ran like crazy so you wouldn't know he did it. And they were so astounded that the, the man had for his eldest daughter, he was able to give the dowry and save that daughter from prostitution. But he still was not there because he had to give it all away. There still wasn't in any better shape. So two more times over the course of the time there, Nicholas kept going. And the story that one of them he launched accidentally landed in a sock by the by the fireplace that he watched through the window and they had either in it or near it. And now you know why we have some things about traditions of science. But he only did these things because he loved the people. And like I said, his generosity and his sacrifice, it's easy to say, well, it's good for him because he was rich. Well, guess what? When he lost it all, he didn't stop. <coughs> he continued to day nine. And that's why he's so well known as a giver. He's so well known across the world as a giver because he became a preacher and a Christian man that loved Jesus. And a miracle of God's grace changed his heart and life, and that's why he is so famous to this day. And I tell you this story for one thing. If we were gripped here in this church, with that same driving, driving force of the love that God's talking about. That brings us to have a true commitment to being a slave in our thinking, caring for each other to the point that we sacrifice. We would so rock the city of Fort St. Lucie that they'd be begged to know us and be around us. Does that make sense? Because that's what happened when Nicholas abandoned all to follow Jesus Christ. Because he learned it from the Word of God. And he lived it like no one in his day lived it. And changed the world forever. Pray with me. Oh, Father, I thank you for each one here today. <coughs> that is your follower that desires to please you. I pray that this quantum change can take effect. I pray that this quantum leap can bring us to a place where we shift gears to such an extreme state that the, the community here at Port St. Lucie says, man, have you seen or know this church called Scent Life? They are mind-boggling. They don't act like anybody we know. They're not normal. They're abnormal. There are ones that live a life that's amazing, and we want it. I pray, Lord, that you would bring us to a miraculous state. We need miracles to really have that extreme life. It won't come from us talking about it, discussing it, and willing it, and wishing it. It comes when you pour out your spirit in such a mighty way that we reflect your glory. And bring a high state in this community. I pray that our church will rise to that standard. I pray that you would move us in the days, in the next couple months here, to change us to make us like you want us to be. I pray this in Jesus' name.
This is the adventure you were born for Walking with God and God walking with you 